Hello, everyone, and welcome to Learning from Memorials to Slavery and the Holocaust, Part 2. My name is Kashet Roman. I am a reference librarian and the head of adult programming at the Irvington Public Library. Due to the high registration numbers for this program and the need to have our panelists in different locations, we'll be using the webinar format instead of the usual meeting format. All audience members, as I've said before, are automatically muted and we are unable to view any video from you. If you have any questions or comments for myself or any of the panelists, we ask that you please submit them by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen rather than using the chat. All questions will be addressed later in the presentation. Please let us know if you want to address a question to a specific panelist if you have any questions, comments, or concerns that are not addressed during the presentation, please feel free to contact the Library Reference Desk at IRVREF at WLSmail.org. That's IRVREF at WLSmail.org. Please be advised that this webinar is being recorded and will be shared at a later date via the Library website and social media. We also advise that this presentation will include frank discussions of sensitive topics, including anti-Black racism, anti-Semitism, slavery, genocide, and sexual assault in the context of U.S. and world history. And now, without further ado, I'll shut off my audio and video and hand things over to our presenter. Good evening. I, I am Robert Dutton, and the four of us call ourselves the Montgomery Four in jest, for reasons that will become obvious later. Left to right in the picture are Linda Rousseau, Adine Usher, Tosha Niger McCormick, and me. Linda. Yes, hello. I'm Linda Rousseau, and I'm an active member of All Souls Unitarian Church where I've been involved with social justice programs for over 10 years. I also focus on ending mass incarceration, solitary confinement, and work to empower families to strategically support their loved ones who are incarcerated. Five years ago, I learned that my ancestors on my father's side owned slaves for over 150 years in Santo Domingo, capital of what today is the Dominican Republic. During the slave rebellion in 1791, my ancestor, Jean Baptiste Clement Rousseau, escaped to Philadelphia where he became a doctor. My name is Adine Ray Usher. I'm an educational consultant and advocate for students with physical disabilities. Social action and racial justice have been a part of my life since childhood, when dinner table conversations centered around racial inequities. At Oberlin, I led the campus NAACP chapter that raised bail money for the student lunch counter sit-ins in Greensboro, North Carolina. And for the last 40 years, I've worked with the racial justice team at the White Plains Unitarian Universalist Congregation. Following the old Quaker saying, my happiness lies at the intersection of my passions and the needs of others. Good evening, I'm Tosha Nigel McCormick. Uh, despite my very Irish last name, I was born in Germany to Jewish Holocaust survivors uh, my parents um, and promptly classified as a stateless alien. America embraced me as a first generation immigrant and I will be forever grateful. My families and my own experience have led me to work with what Fyodor Dostoevsky would call the insulted and the injured, HIV patients, drug users, incarcerated young men, victims of abuse and poverty. I am a therapist and an educator, and my life philosophy has always been the Jewish dictum of tikkun olam, to heal the world. And I, Robert Dutton, am a professor of biology and more specifically genetics. 
which drives discoveries in medicine, including COVID, and explains the mysteries of human migration and ancestry. I have Afro-Caribbean genes from Trinidad, where Columbus actually landed in 1498, and his legacy remains controversial. I am also a Unitarian from All Souls, New York City, and consider myself an activist. We are honored to be hosted by the Irvington Public Library and want to thank Rosemary Gatze for inviting us back. And we thank Keshet Roman for her technical support for this presentation. We want to acknowledge the encouragement and support of Kathy Sears, Sarah Fox, Cox, Rick Feldman, and Chet Carr. We sincerely hope that you find meaning in our presentation. <clears throat> we shall provide opportunities for questions and discussion. Your microphones will be muted for most of the session, so please ask questions in the Q&A when it's open. The event will be recorded. Note, we realize that people hold strong opinions on issues of monuments and memorials. However, we need to describe the varied responses and reactions to these symbols. The death of monuments. The furor over the death of George Floyd has reignited demands to remove dozens of statues and monuments around the country and around the world. They include past presidents, conquistadors, Confederate generals, defenders of segregation, and others whose racial and political views are now widely reviled. Any statue is a repository of memory and a bid for immortality. So what's really at issue here is not the statues per se, but the point of view that they represent. In our presentation today, we attempt to discuss what makes monuments so important to the psyche and ideology of a country and its population. How can pieces of stone become such powerful lightning rods for change, and who should be tasked with making those changes? Why are monuments so important? Monuments deify leaders. Since the advent of the recent Black Lives Matter protests, I look upon a monument with less reverence and more skepticism. For example, Washington was considered a great leader. He was the father of our country, but he owned enslaved people, an issue not discussed in many history books. While I know that George Washington is known as the father of our country, I am compelled to acknowledge the fact that he was also a slave owner. I accept who he is in the context of his full legacy. Why are monuments so important? They glorify wars and conquests, warriors and ideologies. Robert E. Lee, the commander of the Army of the Confederacy, graduated from West Point as a skilled tactician. He fought in the Mexican-American War and put down John Brown's slave insurrection at Harper's Ferry. Lee was reputed to be a brutal slave owner who never spared the whip. The statue was erected in 1890, 25 years after the Civil War ended in 1865, and was recently removed from Monument Avenue in Richmond, Virginia. Why are monuments so important? They justify and perpetuate domination of conquered peoples. They attempt to stop time and freeze progress. In 1984, long before the present controversies, Trinidad and Tobago pioneered the end of Discovery Day that, in quotes, celebrated Columbus's discovery. A decade later, most countries abolished Discovery Day. The first Columbus monument in Trinidad was erected by enslaver Hippolyte Baudet in 1881. 
but many people, including his granddaughter, are now petitioning the mayor of Port of Spain, the capital city, to remove it. Citizens of nearby Tarrytown and Mount Kisco in Westchester are also petitioning to remove statues of Columbus from their villages. I have seen 962 signatures on change.org. Why are monuments so important? They reinforce the dominance of some and intimidate others. This 176-year-old stone slave auction block was removed from a street corner in Fredericksburg, Virginia on June 5th of this year. The removal was initially delayed by persistent lawsuits and the coronavirus. Many blacks refused to walk past the auction block. Particularly troubling was the fact that tourists would pay black boys to pose on the block for photos. For blacks, it has been a source of pain and suffering. After George Floyd's death, crowds chanted, remove the stone and sprayed it with graffiti. A landmark memorial will soon stand on the corner to honor those people who were bought and sold. Why are monuments so important? They celebrate apparent major medical and scientific successes. Dr. J. Marion Sims, born in 1813, until recently was celebrated for his gynecological successes. He developed instruments and techniques for removing fistulas in women. However, they were done by experimenting on enslaved women without anesthesia even when it was available. After major protests, in 2018, his statue was finally removed from Central Park, New York City, to a cemetery. Why are monuments so important? They maintain attitudes of innate superiority, which over time can be dislodged. The slide shows a statue of Edward Colster in Bristol, United Kingdom. His company branded the letters RAC, Royal African Company, on the chests of 100,000 enslaved people and shipped them across the Atlantic. African mercenaries also participated in these crimes. 20,000 of Colston's victims died and were thrown overboard in the crossings. Why do we build memorials? Memorials make us remember. They honor the dead and help in healing. They can also warn against military misadventures with the resulting loss of lives. This is Maya Lin's Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C. Why are memorials so important? They honor the valor of soldiers. The Iwo Jima Memorial is officially known as the Marine Corps War Memorial and is located outside of Arlington Cemetery in Arlington, Virginia. The statue is dedicated to all the people in the U.S. Marine Corps who served and died in defense of our country since 1775. It was built based on a famous photo taken on Mount Suribachi, Japan, during World War II, after one of the deadliest battles of the war in the Pacific. How do some structures become memorials? Memorials can evoke sympathy for the suffering of others. Instead of using his plantation to perpetuate myths to tourists, iconoclast John Cummings turned it into America's first slavery museum. The Whitney Plantation in Louisiana is a rare plantation slash museum that shows accurately the tortured lives of enslaved people. In my opinion, plantations were nothing more than slave labor camps. How do some structures become memorials? Statues of enslaved children 
in the Whitney Plantation Museum are sculpted without eyes as if to protect these children from seeing the horrors of plantation life. Not all memorials are carved in stone. My body is a Confederate monument. Carolyn Randall Williams wrote this article recently in the New York Times. She said, I have rape colored skin. My light brown blackness is a living testament to the rules, the practices, the causes of the old South. If there are those who want to remember the legacy of the Confederacy, if they want monuments, well then, my body is a monument. My skin is a monument. DNA testing has allowed me to confirm I am the descendant of enslaved black women who were domestic servants and white men who raped their health. Most of us with light brown blackness have enslaved ancestors who were raped. The suffering of black women has always been underestimated. Not all memorials are carved in stone. Dead bodies and their DNA are living memorials. By the 18th century, more than 12 million Africans were kidnapped and shipped to the Americas. Two million died at sea. DNA testing by 23andMe showed that many enslaved people in the USA came from Nigeria through the British Caribbean, including Trinidad, and yes, Jamaica, now famous as the ancestral home of our vice presidential candidate. Although 60% of these Africans were male, contemporary African-American DNA contained only 40% of DNA from African males. Why? According to 23andMe, the discrepancy is due to excessive deaths in the male population and rape of the enslaved women by European men who contributed to the gene pool. Like Carolyn Rand Randall Williams, their bodies and their DNA are living memorials. Memorials force us to confront and face cruelty and injustice. Here is the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama. How do we continue to reveal and uncover the truth in our communities through monuments and memorials? What events and individuals should we remember and why? Memorials and monuments reflect in part the ways that some communities have answered these questions. In our country, Reconstruction in 1863 seemed promising. But African Americans suffered tremendous reversals soon afterwards because many whites resisted these changes violently. The National Memorial and Legacy Museum are the two major memorials in Montgomery. They describe African American tragedy but they warn this and future generations to face the truth about history and to take informed action toward reconciliation. Attending the opening of this memorial in April 2018 is what brought us, the Montgomery Four, together. sculpture is a depiction of the arrival of enslaved people in the New World. Kwame Akotobonfo of Ghana created these haunting sculptures that greet visitors at the entrance to the National Memorial for Peace and Justice. They depict the way Africans arrived in the New World. Akotobonfo says, my piece is on slavery. It's the path that leads to lynching. African Americans in particular should understand that we also know their pain. We empathize. 
ironically, a Cotobonfo was denied a visa to the United States in 2017 and therefore prevented from overseeing the installation of his work. As a slave, he would have been welcome. As a free man, not so much. The wall in the background provides an exhaustive history of the African-American experience. Stellies of Steel. At the lynching memorial in Montgomery, the brown steel pillars, or stellies, show the names of counties and the names of victims or simply the designation anonymous. As you proceed through the memorial, the floor gently slopes down, causing the stellies to appear to rise, giving them the appearance of hanging bodies. They represent over 4,000 documented victims lynched after Reconstruction between 1877 and 1950. Here I am talking with a visitor, an activist from Ocoee County near Orlando, Florida, where lynching occurred. Members of her Unitarian congregation have been documenting lynching in Ocoee. The promise of this memorial. Audience, even while you are muted, please repeat these words together and aloud with me. For the hanged and beaten, for the shot, round, burned, for the tortured, tormented, and terrible, for those abandoned by the rule of law, we will remember. Here is the Legacy Museum, from enslavement to mass incarceration. The Legacy Museum is located steps away from one of the most active slave auction sites in America. The outside of the Legacy Museum highlights in its windows events from slavery to Jim Crow on the top left, all the way to mass incarceration, bottom right, from the past to the present. The building itself was once used as a holding pen for enslaved people before they were taken across the street to be auctioned off. The Holocaust Memorial to the Murdered Jews of Europe in Berlin. Memorials are repositories of memory that raise complex questions about which history we choose to remember or whose story we choose to ignore or forget. When we say the Holocaust, we usually refer to the slaughter of six million European Jews by the Nazis. Of course, other groups were also targeted by the regime. Roma, disabled people, communists, resistors, homosexuals, and German people of mixed race from Germany's exploits in Africa. In addition, as we speak, there are genocides taking place in other parts of the world. However, the systematic, coldly bureaucratic planned genocide of a whole people stands out amid the slaughter. So then whose story does a memorial tell and how does it tell that story? What and why should we remember? Writing of memorials in Germany, Ian Buruma, former editor of the New York Review of Books, finds the apt descriptions in German. He distinguishes between a Denkmal, a monument built to glorify a leader, an event, or the nation as a whole, and a Mahnmal, a monument of warning. Holocaust memorials, he says, are monuments of warnings. So how do artists sound these warnings? Should such memorials be literal or abstract? How can the form be the message? Both the Holocaust Memorial and the National Memorial for Peace and Justice convey strong messages through their abstract forms or stellies. 
I'm sorry, the Holocaust 2,711 concrete slabs or steles clearly influenced the design that the National Memorial adopted. They both provide physical and psychological spaces for reflection and mourning. However, the differences in design also reflect their unique messages. The steles of the Holocaust Memorial vary in height from eight inches to 15 feet and cover a vast area, four and a half acres. The architects designed the slabs to produce an uneasy, confusing atmosphere. And they say that the whole sculpture aims to represent a seemingly ordered system that has lost touch with any human reason. Wandering through the massive slabs, a visitor feels disoriented, oppressed, and increasingly closed in. There are no names on the slabs. Many victims were only known by the numbers tattooed on their arms, and there is no escape. Of the millions represented here, only a few survived, my family among them. My mother and father and their four small children escaped from the ghetto in Krakow and through truly heroic efforts, never actually expecting to survive, saved themselves and their children. We are here as survivors to recognize evil, past and present, to educate and collaborate and heed the warnings of these memorials so that the horrors they depict can never happen again. That is why we are here. Learning from the Germans, Grace and the Memory of Evil. Susan Nyman is an Atlanta-born moral philosopher and writer of Jewish heritage, whose journey took her from Harvard to Yale to Tel Aviv University, and finally to the Brandenburg Academy in Berlin, where she has lived for over 20 years. In this book, she explores Germany's initial denial of its complex, com, complicity in Nazi atrocities. Eventually, aided in part by attitudes of their youth, Germany finally accepted responsibility and condemned its Nazi past. Nyman contrasts that evolution with the inability of the United States to confront slavery and its racist consequences. How Germany confronted its racist past. It removed public displays of its Nazi past. It educated the population through readings, lectures, drama, and music. It displayed signs, plaques, and memorials nationwide to honor the victims of Nazi atrocities. Susan Nyman says, imagine an America where the raw and brutal truth of slavery and racial terror were integrated into historical narratives of American exceptionalism. What can we do? We can read books. Read Robin DiAngelo's White Fertility, a book in high demand according to Irvington's librarian, Rosemary Gatsby. Read Ibram X. Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist. Read Thomas Chatterton Williams' Unlearning Racism and follow his critiques of D'Angelo's and Kendi's excessively binary categorizations. Read Susan Nyman's Learning from the Germans, which describes how as the Germans did, America can address its racist history. Join or start a book club. Rick Feldman helps to run an excellent book club in Riverdale, 
where members grapple with issues of racism. What can we do locally? Change starts at home. Document lynching in your area as a group. And Ernest Daly from Montgomery for Public Display of Education. The woman standing with a D next to the Staley's in a previous slide has worked with Unitarians in Oakley and earned a Staley for display in their town. Support organizations like Papillon2030.org that promote self-help through covenants. Support efforts to document slavery and to educate your village as Kathy Sears Sarah Cox and Vinnie Bagwell are doing in Irvington. What else can we do? Build memorials and road markers to honor enslaved people. Transform existing monuments? Hmm. Here in this picture is what National Public Radio calls a joyful transformation of the Robert E. Lee pedestal in Virginia. Work with historical societies to educate your community. Work, work to eradicate systemic racism in your schools, health systems, housing, and your businesses. Use your voting power to affect change. Here is Brian Stevenson, one of the most powerful voices for justice in the world and the inspiring leader of the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery. He advocates, first, confronting the truth about atrocities such as slavery as a first step toward reconciliation. Next comes the involvement of we the people who can all work for justice on a local level. Even though we are muted, let us read Stevenson's words all aloud and in unison. I don't think slavery ended in 1865. It just evolved. If you love your community, then you need to be insisting on justice in all circumstances. We can take questions from the Q&A, or if you raise your hand, we can unmute your microphone for discussion. Okay, everyone, thank you very much. Uh, I don't see any new questions in the Q&A at this moment, so uh, it should be appearing at the bottom of your screen for the audience members. If you're having any trouble finding that, I'm keeping an eye on the chat just in case we need to communicate through there. But we'll give you all a moment to send in some questions from there. I do see one participant has raised their hand. I'm going to allow Lily to speak now. Lily, you should be unmuted. No? Okay. I'm not hearing anything on that and I do see a question that has come in in the Q&A uh, from Karen Steele asking, what has been the most difficult monument for all of you to discuss? Hmm. Oof. <laughs> uh, can I take that one for a second? I think uh, both the sculpture in front of the um, Memorial for Peace and Justice and the Memorial for Peace and Justice itself, if you have been there and seen it, uh, it does an amazing job of bringing the horror 
to life. And uh, that is a painful thing to look at every time uh, for me personally. I'll take that one. Even though many would disagree with me, I have a lot of problems with George Washington. I visited the plantation and I know how poorly he treated his enslaved workers. Um, so that troubles me the most. For Anyone me, else? <laughs> for me, uh, Columbus is, uh, it it's, uh, evokes a painful memory because he's been so honored and respected everywhere in the world for the places that he discovered. And, uh, and then, as I learn more and more of the people who've been victimized by his discovery, especially the Native Americans and, of course, the African slaves, um, and the way his, um, his actions were justified, I thought that this is, is just a, a very, um, very indefensible um, person, someone who I cannot um, really respect anymore. And, but I still understand the fact that many people uh, worship almost Columbus for what he's done. He's brought us what America is and what many of the countries of the West are. So it's a sort of a double-edged sword for me, but on the whole, I think he's the one I would probably revile most. For me, I would say the Peace and Justice Memorial, because the people who died, who were lynched, they had nobody there representing them. You didn't know who these people were. And it's just astonishing to be there. And, and, and there's almost a sense of sadness. You don't have to know anyone who was, who was killed. And as you walk, the stalays get higher and higher, and you're walking down the path below. It's, it's very emotional. And I can't thank Brian Stevenson enough for giving us this memorial. We have a couple more questions from the Q&A. And then I'll address a couple questions in the chat. Uh, a comment from Irene Garbo, feeling very great, uh, sorry, feeling grateful for this very informative and inspiring presentation. Thank you, Irene, <laughs> my friend from Florida. And a question from Joy saying, curious, I am frustrated hearing this. I want to know what I can do to eliminate my anger. Hmm. Well, I would, I would decide what in your community can you do to contribute? What can you get engaged in? Uh, for instance, I work with a prison organization, and, and I work with families who have loved ones incarcerated. I also mentor a returnee from prison, and I work with our social justice committee at our church, so there's lots of things that you can do. Uh, but check out your place of worship or, or your own community and see what's happening. It depends on, on what skills you have and your background and training, but everyone can contribute something. And as I mentioned, Papillon is an organization which, has, um, which asks people to make a, a commitment, a covenant to doing something. If you are a teacher, you might want to tutor kids after school. And that would be your uh, commitment until 2030, 2030. And so that's, uh, that's one kind of organization that allows everyone to do something. I would, I would say read as much as you can, educate yourself, and then try to educate as many other people as you can. The whole foundation of this anti-Black behavior is all founded on a horrible lie. Um, and I'd ask myself this, what did any of those 12 million Africans who were dragged to this country do to any of the Europeans? 
There was no rhyme or reason for any of that. And what we have seen subsequently, century after century, is mistreatment based on a horrible lie. I think one of the things that uh, all of this requires is uh, some self-examination, first and foremost, because I think we all hold on to beliefs that we've either been taught or been exposed to and that we sort of take for granted and don't ever question. And yes, I think you need to read, you need to educate yourself, but you also have to do an honest look inside and say, you know, really, what kind of attitudes am I walking around with that uh, I don't even question? So, yeah. It's like the old song from, from the movies, the Broadway play South Pacific. You have to be taught before it's too late. Mm. You have to be taught before you're six or seven or eight to teach all, to hate all the people your relatives hate. You have to be carefully taught. We have a question in the chat from Deborah asking if monuments are ever valid. Oh. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, and, and it's not the person who discovered the country as much as a local person, maybe in your community or in your state, who's done good works uh, for, for their community and their, and their state. So clearly there are. Um, it's, it's, we've put too many people up on high pedestals and then boom, down it comes. Uh, we can't do that anymore. Well, it's a good question, right? Um, we do want to celebrate people, but then the question becomes, who do we want to celebrate? And who do we want to remember? Um, who is worth that kind of um, adoration, right? And acclaim, uh, uh, acclaim. And uh, we've kind of gone with uh, we've kind of gone with military guys, generals, kings. You know, people in power uh, have liked to see themselves on pedestal and monuments. The question is, the rest of us uh, need to maybe rethink who is worth it, and and what they've done with their power, and whom they have hurt with their power. And in that vein, I think uh, Sarah um, and Kathy have done a good job by investigating in, in Irvington, our little village here, uh, the history of enslaved people and identifying several of them. And uh, now the, the village will be constructing, with their help, uh, a, a memorial to, um, to 15, I believe. Kathy can help us with that. Um, uh, enslaved people who died and who lived in Irvington. Of course, they were sold off and, and their families broken up as a result, like many enslaved people, um, when, the, when the slave master uh, dies and he gives off his property to different people, fa the families are part of, of his property and they get distributed all over the place. But, um, but memorializing them, I think, is a very, um, is, is certainly worth uh, doing. It's very valuable. And if, if I can just add, not just when the slave owner died, as, if, as in Thomas Jefferson's situation, since he was a poor manager of his financial affairs, every time he got into debt, he sold off some human beings. Uh, next one is from Hugh saying this was a very provocative presentation and that these challenges seem overwhelming. Hugh wants to know, where does one begin and how is it possible to achieve tangible impact? I think we answered that in, in many different ways. Getting involved is uh, always the, the bottom line on these things. I see that Iraj wants to find out how he can get in contact with um, 
with the Riverdale Book Club. And I'm sure that he will get that information soon. And so uh, people who are inspired by, by these events uh, should make a commitment to doing something in your own life that will change uh, what's going on. Voting, getting other people to vote, and, uh, or working in your library with groups of people who are interested in these particular issues, or historical societies. These are all avenues and opportunities for you to change the world. I, I would like to add that I think as Americans, we need a much deeper understanding of systemic racism. In other words, racism that comes from the top, racism which is legislated by the people we put in power. There's a reason why so many African Americans live in poverty. There's a reason why their wages are kept low. There's a reason why many of them cannot make more money, why they cannot get loans from banks. Uh, a few of us are allowed through, but not too many. Oh, I would I would also, yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. I, I would also say that, you know, when you talk about it being overwhelming, it is overwhelming. It's a, it's a huge problem. So if you're thinking in terms of, Solving the whole thing, you're not going to be able to. But on the other hand, every small action is like a pebble in a pond, right? It will expand outward in its significance and its importance and impact on other people. So I think if we're thinking about the whole uh, issue, it's huge. Uh, if you can do something in your community that's very local, that makes a local difference, that in itself will, you know, have consequences uh, going outward. And I would mention Ibram X. Kendi in his book, uh, How Not to Be, a, How to be an Anti-Racist. I'm sorry, I'm saying the name wrong. <laughs> I forget the name exactly. Uh, but he, he believed that the answer is in policy, policy, policy. These things don't happen by magic. There are policies with health care and housing and education and all sorts of things. Uh, and, and that's what needs to be looked at on a state level, a local level. And you really have to educate yourself on what, what moves you, what, what is it you want to get connected with. Okay. We have a whole bunch of questions that came in right about the same time in the Q&A. So I do apologize if anyone in the chat feels that we haven't gotten to them just yet, but there was a lot that came in at the same time. Uh, Tosha, a question from Jeanette. With your view of history across two continents, can any monument be built that will last a century? Can we know what will be seen as honorable in the future? That's an excellent question. Um, I would say uh, maybe not so much monuments, but memorials, because we can look at the past and we can look at the people who have suffered. And if we can remember the people who have suffered uh, by recognizing their suffering, acknowledging their suffering, memorializing their suffering, I think then that's something that can carry, hopefully, into the future. In terms of monuments, I think that's a good question. I, I, I don't know what would last. We're seeing this right now, right? Certainly when people put up those monuments 100 plus years ago, uh, they thought that they were going to be there forever. But when we look at history, we also see that monuments go up and then they come down. When history changes, monuments come down it's it's a historic it's a historic given so in some ways that's very i think hope inspiring because it means that we can change okay then we have a question from jamie 
Do the panelists recommend following or voting for any particular politicians nowadays as being the ones who are probably most effective in eliminating racism? That has to be your decision. Uh, we can't uh, state a particular name of anyone that you might want to uh, vote out or vote in. But I, I think that most people will come to the right decision. Would anyone else like to address that? Well, I have, I have my ideas, but I, I won't say because Robert, I think, would be upset. <laughs> I, would just say, I would just say, find a candidate who doesn't peddle in hate. Uh, a question addressed to Linda from Irene. Are you the descendant of both the slave owner and slave? Was it common practice for the slave to take their owner's last name? Um, yes, yes. Um, and the reason that many African Americans are now choosing names that are very, very strange to the European ear is because they are trying to separate themselves and find a name that they think mo most approximate the name they had before they came here. And just the part that was addressed to Linda, uh, if you were the descendant of both a slave owner and a slave? Uh, I was uh, a descendant of uh, a slave, uh, slave owner and who owned uh, three plantations um, in Santo Domingo. Uh, for, uh, I mean, he would, my, my ancestor was born into it because they were there for several generations running the plantations. We have a question from Jacqueline. Instead of tearing down all these sculptures, what about posting information about what happened during that time period and educate all? I have a feeling that that is exactly what's going to happen with many of the many of the monuments, because I don't think there's anyone on the panel that wants all of the monuments torn down. Some of the most egregious ones, yes. Some of the ones that give daily pain to people and intimidate them, yes. But I would like full disclosure on something like the Washington Monument. I think uh... well, I, I remember uh, in a visit to Budapest in Hungary, um, all the communist, Stalinist monuments had been taken down in the city, but had been moved to a park um, in close proximity to the city where people could still go and look at them and learn from them. In that way, the monuments themselves were not destroyed, but they also were no longer in these positions of honor and, uh, you know, uh, expounding on philosophies and politics that were no longer acceptable to the people who lived there. Yeah, and, uh, and there, I believe, there, there are sculptures that are memorials in which you can see hundreds of shoes, for instance, of, uh, of people who had been uh, sent off to the camps. And so that's a statue or a memorial that replaces um, the, the Nazi past with something that's much more moving. We have a question from Hugh. Should deeply offensive memorials be torn down precipitously or should there be some kind of deliberative process which hears all sides? I think full disclosure is, is really important. And so whether the, the, the monument is going to be taken down and removed to a, to a cemetery, as is the case um, of, um, of the, the surgeon, or whether it's going to remain, it has to be put in context. We can't have somebody standing there looking honorable opposite the New York Academy of Medicine when in fact he's been uh, practicing medicine, uh, so-called medicine, on, on, on enslaved women with no anesthesia. And so if it's put in context, that's great. 
it would probably be better as it had in this case they they put his cemetery um his um his his monument to in a, in a <coughs> in a cemetery which is quite appropriate um i think that's what happened with the fredericksburg um <coughs> slave auction block. Uh, you remember that I said it took yet several years um, in litigation to finally get it changed. There was only one black member of the city council and he was the only one who year after year voted for its removal. Several of the white business people in town wanted the statue to remain because it was good for tourism. So litigation was able to be played out. And in Germany, uh, you know, there are signs all over the country which indicate uh, events and people who in the past were heroes and now who've been removed. And we don't see much of that in, in the United States. I attended a conference in, in Schwabing in southern Germany and my son discovered uh, a sign which was in German, and we got it translated, and it was saying, this is the place where Mengele had, uh, had killed many people who had been living in, in, uh, in this asylum, and it was now a beautiful conference center. And so Germany has acknowledged in many of its uh, places. These signs are all over Germany. That's what the, the conference organizer told us in justifying the choice of place. But the signs are all over Germany. And we don't have that in the United States yet. And so I think it's important to acknowledge what happened. And that has a very strong cathartic effect on the population. It seems to me a venue where you could have a statue and an identifying marker explaining uh, the negative impact that this individual had on, on the individuals and society where, where he, he worked or made use of people. Uh, I think it's very important for people to learn, be educated about what these people actually did that are being represented with these monuments. We've got no, a, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Maybe a museum. Can't they have a, a section in a museum where they have a statue and then they list and talk or they have uh, someone who works in the museum, who walks around and speaks with people and talks about, hands out information. Seems to me there's lots of different ways it could go. And yeah. educating the children in school, the kind of history that we have in schools here, doesn't mention any of these things. Yes. Total. And I think, you know, I think we walk through the streets most of the time. There are statues. We never look at them. So I'm not sure that putting information next to the statue would be terribly effective. What we do know is there's a statue and it honors a person. Uh, and even if we don't look, that's the impression that you get from statues. So I think, and monuments. So the, the question then becomes the placing itself of the monument is the message. And, uh, if we want to uh, kind of not celebrate certain kinds of attitudes, history, and so forth, leaving those statues in prominent public places seems to me problematic. Another thing that's very problematic is since our educational system has been so dishonest when it comes to the black experience in the United States, your average American thinks that slavery wasn't so bad. And they have no idea of the horrendous, horrendous conditions under which people lived for hundreds of years and the terrific, horrible things that were done to them. If they knew more, they wouldn't be fighting to support these statutes. Okay, we have still quite a few questions to go through. Is everyone okay to continue answering? There's over a dozen questions at the moment. Yes. Okay, yep. we have a question from Kate asking, how do we collectively decide what parts of history to memorialize in monuments? 
is there a process you've seen recommended? The Germans. Well, I mean, there are always there are always meetings and discussions, and you know, civic meetings and discussions before a statue goes up somewhere. Uh, the question then becomes, you know, who's in on those meetings, and uh, who gets to participate in the decision making? I think if you can open up the decision making to people with differing points of views which we'll find anyway, but some people I think are generally excluded because they're not in powerful enough positions in society, then, um, you know, you can have a communal decision making, I think, about statues. And you also have to have a nationwide understanding of what was right and what was wrong. This is something that Germany worked very hard on. I had a chance to live in Germany as a child because of my father's work. And I'll never forget my very good piano teacher who said, Hitler was really a fine man. He was just misunderstood. Right? This was six years after the war. So the message hadn't gotten to her. So people, first of all, in large numbers have to believe that a terrible wrong was committed. Yes, people remain in denial for a long time. And, uh, and Germany has done a good job, as uh, Susan Nyman points out. Um, not an not entirely successful job, but still, relatively speaking, a good job at trying to re-educate people, remove the, the, the old uh, uh, monuments, and also to encourage people to discuss and to take part in activities that would promote a better society. And uh, hopefully this will happen here as well, but it's much slower. And people have not been aware, but now is a time where so many people have become so in, uh, exposed to the impact of memorials, monuments, and to the, uh, this, to, there's so much discussion about the death of black people at the hands of police and different kinds of um, injustices. Education, in Irvington there's discussion about um, what are we going to do with our schools? That's good. And so I think this is a time when we have a, a unique opportunity to really make a big impact. And so it would be uh, incumbent upon all of you to do something, take action, join a committee, join a historical society, check out Papillon and other organizations that might uh, move the needle forward. I would just add that the good news is that the, the protests have really been shaking things up like crazy. And, and that's a good thing. That's, that's what we need because there's, there has been no understanding for such a long time or just acceptance. Uh, and now, now too much information is out there that, that cannot be ignored. And so it's an exciting thing, even though it's maybe messy and complicated, but each community can start to work and to look at monuments and, and what they want to do. We have a question from Hanan. One of the things we can do is to look at the current injustices and work to stop them. In this context, I would mention the plight of the Palestinians who are mistreated and their lands occupied, partly as an indirect result of the Holocaust. Yes. I agree. It's uh, Hanan and uh, <clears throat> Karen have been working on this problem for a long time, trying to bring uh, peace in the Middle East by getting uh, both sides to, to, to agree to new protocols and to advance and to recognize each other's humanity. And uh, I agree that, uh, that those are areas that are very much in need of, of action. I think, I think it's also uh, an example to show us that one Holocaust does not justify another and that 
because we have been victimized, this does not give us the moral right to victimize others. Okay. Uh, we have a few more questions in the Q&A. I see that we've had someone waiting to ask a live question in the attendee list. Uh, would you all like to uh, let me allow this person to speak or do you want, still want to address that last question at this moment? Let the person speak. Okay. Uh, let's see. Tony, you should be uh, able to speak now. Uh, you need to unmute. I just did. Um, first of all, I apologize. I, I, was, I got in on this late, and it sounds like it was a very, very powerful discussion. Um, but the fact that there are always going to be, I hate to use the word, but stupid, illiterate people who are always going to deny history. They deny the horrors of Hitler. They deny the Holocaust. They deny slavery. But I, I don't think it's quite fair for you to say that most people don't know the horrors of slavery. I think there have been so many um, movies, presentations, discussions, panels, that we, anyone that's, that's halfway intelligent is very much aware of how horrible slavery was. And I don't think any of us are trying to justify it in any way. I think it's appalling. Slavery is absolutely appalling. There is no way to justify it. But I'm sorry, I believe things need to be done legally. You can't just say, I don't want that statue there, and I'm going to pull it down. That is wrong. We have to have a system of rules, because then we're as bad as everybody else. We have to take the high road and say, I, ab I abhor this. I don't want it there. We're going to have a, a, a town meeting, a city meeting, and we're going to vote to take it down. I don't think people have the right to just go in and tear things down because they don't like it. Is it horrible? Yes. Does it represent something that bothers them immensely? Yes. But I don't think you can just go in and tear it down because you don't like it. That's chaos. The world has to live with rules. I agree. I think we should not be tearing down uh, statues uh, willy-nilly. But, um, at, but uh, your statement about uh, all of the popul of a large fraction of the population being well informed about these issues, if you take an example, for instance, the plantation, many people go down to, uh, on riverboat uh, tours and stop at plantations. For many years, those plantations have been uh, supporting, in, in, in a way, uh, slavery. They've never discussed the fate of those uh, enslaved people until Cummings converted a plantation into one that would educate people about what was really going on in the plantation itself. And uh, as, as Adine pointed out, those plantations were really labor camps. And uh, in, um, um, <clears throat> in one discussion, Susan Nyman, uh, in, with, in a discussion with Susan Nyman, People said that those, those uh, plantations were really concentration camps. But most people who take boats and go down the river and stop at all of these places never even think about these issues. So I don't think that the population on the whole are well educated about these issues. But I do support you, your ideas that um, just taking down statues and breaking them up is not really a constructive action. Well, if I may, uh, I would like to disagree. I think that uh, it, very few revolutions have happened uh, without the breaking of some things. And if you're talking about staying within the law, just look at every police officer who has felt it within the right, his right within the law, to simply shoot down black people willy-nilly and at will, knowing there's not going to be any consequences. You ask them and they'll say they acted within the law. The law by itself, if it's an unjust law, needs to go. And the same is true with statues. Uh, we are hopefully, I'm hoping, uh, 
in a moment of revolution. And when it comes to revolutions, um, you know, it's, it's going to get uncomfortable for a lot of people. I, I would also like to add to that, that yes, people may know that slavery was terrible, but they may also think that blacks are so subhuman that this kind of treatment isn't wrong. So we see today very strong vestiges of what went on in slavery and directly after that. How many people in white America are incensed by the horrible conditions of schools in black communities that are poor because they don't have the money to make them better? How many people in white America are concerned that so many blacks are consigned to the lowest paying jobs? So you could just go down, down the road. There are just so many different conditions which have not really improved that much from slavery and reconstruction. And I think for a lot of whites, unfortunately, achievement on the part of blacks is a threat to white dominance. They do not see a country where we share. They see a country where whites dominate. And if one group is going to dominate, then believe me, other people have to stay on the periphery and you have to keep them on the periphery. I, I might also just quickly add this. My, my favorite comment on this came from Lyndon Baines Johnson who said, if you can convince the poorest white man that he's better than the best black man, you can pick his pockets. In fact, he'll empty them for you. So the idea is that racism has also been used politically to, which we're seeing now, right? To um, actually, uh, keep people in line who are feeling aggrieved, but who are in fact, you know, uh, uh, economically disadvantaged, being taken advantage of, but because somebody's convinced them they're better than any black person, it's okay. So we have a long way to go when it comes to educating people about this. And uh, I think, you know, we can start with some monuments. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. We have a question from Julandre oh. asking, thinking about Stevenson quote, uh, also my apologies if I mispronounced that name, I wasn't sure about the accent marks there. Uh, thinking about the Stevenson quote and the well-documented evolution of slavery and race-based oppression, I find the removal of certain statues, Lee, Columbus, Sims, disingenuous. Could the removal of these statues be helping nations to forget that we once held folks with dubious morals, folks who committed terrible acts in high esteem? By removing these memories from public view, are we only making a superficial change? Are we helping to install a veil behind which oppressing systems and people can simply put on new clothes, so to speak? <laughs> Interesting uh, analysis, Gilander. Uh in a way, that's true. I think if you uh, if you forget about some someone, you often forget about what that person did. Um, but I still think that uh, <clears throat> that having information available with the statues is one way of addressing it. Uh, and if you do remove the, the person's statue to a cemetery or someplace, um, you know there are other mechanisms for remembering. The, the, the evil that they perpetuated. As, as I mentioned before, um, uh, Harriet Washington has written a book called Medical Apartheid. And she has uh, documented a lot of abuses, medical abuses, which, um, which now deter African-Americans 
from participating in really important clinical trials. For instance, COVID, the, the statistics seem to indicate that relatively few African-Americans are participating in the vaccine trials, okay? So that means that there may be side effects that may not affect, that may affect them that we won't know about until it's deployed. So, but this is all coming from the, the Tuskegee experiments and things like that, where African-Americans have been abused in, in, in the course of, uh, of experimentation. So it's a sort of a double-edged sword. I don't think that we want to, re re um, to have these statues so present that we, people continue to make heroes of them. Yeah. And the people in Tarrytown, for instance, want to take down Columbus's statue. But I don't know that if we did, that we would ab absolutely forget about him. We, we have enough documentation about the impact of his uh, deeds. I think there's something we're also forgetting. It's the f lingering fear and intimidation that African Americans have suffered since we first came in the hold of ships. And I was listening to a woman in Mississippi talk about the joy in her heart she felt when the Confederate flag was taken down off the flagpole in front of the State House. These symbols were put up not only to glorify the Confederacy, but they were to keep blacks in their place. So we have to give credence to our ability to lift some of of this fear and intimidation off of the necks of people who have never done anything wrong to this country. We have a question that I do not have a direct phrasing of it as I've had to communicate with the question asker to clarify some points, but uh, it amounts to the Washington Monument, the obelisk specifically, being a copy of the obelisk form from ancient Egypt and a traditional Egyptian religion, uh, as also seen in many places in Europe, uh, I guess frequently used uh, by Europeans in imitation of this specifically ancient Egyptian religious form. Uh, the question, uh, question asker Lennox asks uh, why you feel this is not taught in schools? <coughs> There's lots that's not taught in schools. And uh, the origin of the obelisk is, is perhaps interesting, especially for historians. But I would say more important is uh, to understand the contributions that these people have made and uh, what their lives were like. If we're talking about Washington or we're talking about any other president, we need to know uh, what their views were and what they did for the people, uh, black and white, enslaved and, and free. And, uh, it is uh, historically significant that some of these uh, mon monuments may have maybe duplications or variations of other structures. The, 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 mem the memorial in Montgomery, as Tosha pointed out, um, was designed uh, similar to, to the, the Berlin Holocaust Museum because they both employed uh, steles to, to represent uh, bodies that, that were victimized. But um, it's not, uh, I think that it's interesting to know the history of, of, of the development of design and so on, but I think it's even more important to know uh, who's, uh, who's, who are the victims and why those memorials are there and what do they emphasize and the message that they convey. You know, I, I just want to point out that obelisks in Egypt were also put up by enslaved people. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. We have uh, about eight or nine more questions remaining, including one person in the audience with a hand raised. 
Uh, is it all right if I go ahead and allow that participant to speak? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, Nina, you'll need to click to unmute. You have to unmute your microphone. Hmm. We're still not hearing you, Nina. Go ahead. Hello? Hello? Oh, hello? Um, Nina? Am I on? Yes. Nina, is that you? Yeah, but I, I, you know what, I, I actually <laughs> may have hit it inadvertently, but that's okay. I can... Um, we can hear you. I can hear you now. My focus is on the context of, we'll get back to the original discussion of statues and monuments. Um, you know, I really like the fact that you did talk about the context and the complexity of some of our feelings because a lot of feelings were evoked in me about this being coming from the field of art and, you know, I, I see the complexity of, of the qualities of a lot of, of, of the, let's say the founding fathers, of course I know all the the bad things like the slavery, but but I also want to recognize the good points that they gave us this wonderful country, the wonderful parts, the democracy, the Bill of Rights. Um, the, you know, I I want that still recognized. I want the good part recognized. Also, understanding the complexity of it that they're real people, and they had a lot of did a lot of bad things too. How how do how do I reconcile these feelings in myself? On the one hand, yes, to honor them, but 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 also to recognize the the, the ills of the times of, of so many of them. It was kind of a you know how do I reconcile that? I guess that's my question. Yeah, I, I would say uh, in terms of uh, in terms of slavery, there were people during those times who were abolitionists. In their day, they were dead set, dead set against slavery. So there were people who understood fully that this was uh, an affront to humanity and, and should not be occurring. So um, I guess I don't, you know, I think that it's, it's important to recognize the fact that not everybody uh, didn't, I mean, it just wasn't something that was maybe talked about the way it's being talked about today. Um, I, I, think it's, I think it's important to recognize both sides of the person, that what the, the contributions they make to the society, but then also recognize their imperfections, their, their failings, so to speak. And that's what I call looking at, at the full picture. Of, and of course, it gets complicated when we're talking about our founding fathers. I think nobody really wants to be tearing down monuments. Um, that's certainly an improvement over those who only see the positive in the Confederate messages and refuse to admit that they did anything wrong. Oh, that's, that's terrible. Or even see themselves as the victims in that story. Yes, or see themselves as the victims, yes. We have a question in the Q&As from Joan asking, where does a figure like Anne Hutchinson fit into this? As a symbol of religious liberty who was killed by indigenous peoples despite making friends with many members of their community? In, con in conflicts, innocent, good people get hurt. And we have a question from Alan asking, under whose authority have most of the Confederate statues been erected? I am not aware that the population in general have been given the right to vote on their erection. 
might be wrong? Has it been primarily up to mayors and town councils? I will take that on. I recently read a really interesting article that says the taxpayers are paying for the continued care of all of these monuments. Organizations like Daughters of the Confederacy and other similar Confederate organization wanted these statues erected many of them many years after the Civil War. And because they had connections with local politicians who had connections to money, taxpayers, black and white, are paying for the continued care of these statues. And to the, to the, to the tune of millions of dollars. Let's see. We have, let's see. We have a question from an anonymous attendee. A moving emotional presentation to play devil's advocate. We are being judgmental on one side, the huge systemic problem. Why has this issue not been addressed more aggressively for 500 plus years? Was it culturally acceptable? Have we reached a point where people have become sensitive? I personally appreciate the positives that George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, et cetera, et cetera, have done for the USA. As an immigrant, my family achieved a lot more than what they had, could have if they had stayed in Russia or Iran. Historic given, but we shouldn't down destroy culture of past, but take the root of education. As Rabin recited, you've got to be taught. Is that a question? I guess uh, it's a bit of an open question, a bit of a, a, a comment trying to uh, bring about discussion. Uh, we're all immigrants, so many of us, and uh, some, of course, we all came from Africa 65,000 years ago. We were, we were all there. And uh, um, 65,000 years ago is when now uh, humans started moving out of Africa into different parts of the, of the world. So that's where we all came from. We were all um, immigrants, even more rec recent immigrants like myself. I came here uh, maybe about 40 years ago. The, um, but the point is, and of course, I'm grateful for the opportunities that I have uh, been provided. But that's not to say, I think as, a, as an immigrant, I think it's in, incumbent upon me to, to be critical of what my country is doing and how they're progressing and what they should be doing instead. And so while I'm grateful for the opportunities that I've had, and I've had many, I still think that, uh, that it's important for this country to take a stand on lots of issues, especially those that have to do with its uh, racist past. And so I don't see a contradiction between coming from a con another country and migrating to the United States and, uh, and, and being loyal to the country and what we're doing. I think it's incumbent on us to, to try to make it better. I would like to add to that, that um, the, the gentleman who's is speaking family came here as immigrants to a country that was already, already very wealthy, thanks in part to slave labor. Slave labor made America the rich country it is, pure and simple. We have a question from Jamie asking if there's a school curriculum related to the topic that you recommend, one that depicts the reality but is age appropriate. Hmm. Most high school textbooks now are doing a much better job of teaching about slavery and racism. I'd have to turn that back to a librarian to find out exactly what current books are available for younger children. Uh, as a librarian, I would recommend that anyone interested reach out to our reference department uh, by calling 
or emailing us at earthref at wlsmail.org. Depending on the age of the child in question, we can put you in touch with our children's librarian or our young adult librarian for recommendations on the subject. We have a question from Jacqueline. Uh, let's see. Oh, I believe, let's see. A uh, comment from Jacqueline saying that the National Sculpture Society encourages inclusive public debate about public monuments without destruction and vandalism. I believe we've already pretty much addressed that, but are there any particular thoughts regarding the National Sculpture Society? No. You're no. saying they don't want statues taken down? Uh, yes. I don't think it's that simple. I agree. That's not simple at all. <laughs> Let's see, I am just double checking that we have not missed any particular mm. questions. Let's see. Uh, we have a comment from Jeanette that teaching tolerance from SPLC is a good educational tool made for teachers. That appears to be everything that's in the Q&A at the moment. We did wind up dismissing a few questions that were related to subjects that were addressed by the time we got to those questions. I do apologize if anyone felt that their question was not answered satisfactorily. Uh, as I said earlier, we can uh, forward any further questions to the panelists to be addressed at a later time if you want to email us at ervref at wlsmail.org or email me directly at kroman at wlsmail.org. That's K-R-O-M-A-N. Uh, we are seeing a lot of very positive comments in the chat. And there is one question here. There's a difference between general education and monuments. Whom should we honor in monuments? Whom should we mourn together in memorials? And that is from, sorry, uh, that is from Deborah. Hmm. I think that's a question that we're in fact grappling with, right? Um, the, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, I asked that in my, in my little piece, who do we remember? Who do we forget? Who do we memorialize? Those are questions I think that have to be uh, debated and answered both locally and nationally. And if the person has done great good and great harm at the same time, that uh, complexity has to be clearly delineated. Yes. We have a comment from an anonymous attendee uh, saying, while we, need, while we strongly need more education of whites, we also have to address the need for education for black students to stay in schools. Oh, absolutely. The, the condition of education for many black students, particularly in the inner city, is, is an abomination. And if the country truly cared about educating black children, they would not allow that to happen. Our system of paying for schooling based on property taxes, when poor people have little or no property, is just, it's consigning these children to a third or fourth class status for the rest of their lives. So they get the worst education, their parents get the worst jobs, and we're surprised that their communities are in turmoil. Why are we surprised? Well, that's legislation that needs to, that needs to be addressed, literally. And political action, strong political action. I mean, we have it here in New York City. And in Westchester. The schools for people of color are an abomination here yeah. compared to people. And we've come to expect. It's all based on taxes. It's outrageous. 
Yes. It's so discriminatory. And, and it's done year after year with the understanding that black children are not capable of learning. If you defunded white schools the way you defund black schools, you get the exact same educational results. Okay, there is one remaining question that I see in the chat from Deborah. Uh, I'm not sure if we addressed this already. At the turn of the 19th and 20th century, those in power valued the work of the Confederacy somehow. Today, we value African-American leaders through history. In another era, God help up, that may change. How do we, as a society, evaluate the appropriateness of monuments, of memorials? It seems to be the urgency of the era. Thank you all for this presentation and discussion. We need to think and continue the discussion. So, I guess the question, how do we evaluate the appropriateness of these monuments and memorials now? Well, that's, that's something for a discussion. We need to sit down and, and look at all sides and do it with honesty, because we're really trying to change what the current situation, the way things are. That's why so many monuments are being knocked down indiscriminately, because it doesn't work anymore. And I think the monuments are symbolic, and, and we have to ask, what do they stand for? And is that something we still want to stand for as a country or a society? Are they, are they stretch statues to domination or are they statues to people, men and women, who've done great good? I think we'll find many more statues and uh, memorials being erected uh, that are much more uh, celebratory of African-American people um, and other people who have contributed, Native Americans, there are women, women. There are I'm very few statues of women. I'm getting to that too. <laughs> I, I have to work with three women in this. <laughs> so we have, uh, you know, we have to recognize and give credit to to the deeds of other people, and I think that that's happening, and I'm pleased to see that it is happening. So it will take time, but we're making progress. And we are so grateful to all the people who have tuned into our program this evening. And to Keshet, who has been so good at uh, managing questions and chats and so on. It's been wonderful. Thank you, Keshet. On that note, I'll show my face again. Uh, I believe that all the questions from the Q&A and the chat have been addressed. If Thank there you. are any parting comments from any of our panelists. Just thank you for giving us that opportunity. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Right. And thank all of you for joining us, for being so involved in making this discussion happen. Hopefully uh, we'll be able to continue this discussion in the Irvington community and Westchester and the United States at large uh, in the future and that it will continue to be a active and live conversation. Uh, on that note, I am going to go ahead and end this meeting unless there's any other last minute comments. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much. As I said, we have recorded this presentation and it will be made available via our website and social media, including Twitter and Facebook at a later date. Uh, due to the length of this presentation, it may take a bit of time for it to be converted and uploaded. So we will try to make announcements when that is available, but it probably won't be this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again to everyone, including our audience members and the question askers. We will hopefully be continuing to have programs along these lines, so keep an eye out on our online calendar. 
and our email mailing list as well as our social media for further announcements. Have a wonderful evening and a great weekend. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.